Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome back to another Designer Studio episode. Today we're taking a closer look at the Titan II Gemini launch vehicle. So I got Amanda and Camera Guy here joining me, the kits designers. Uh, guys, tell me a little bit about this. Obviously you guys are uh, both in a space race, but your first model designed for Brick Mania. Now it is complete in front of you. What do you think? We're really, really pleased with how the process went in the final product. So as a display piece, the printing on this is, is absolutely excellent. But what, one of the things that I really like about it is you guys kind of went the extra mile. And even in this teeny scale, you use the bricks to really represent a lot of the detail in this build. Can you point out kind of some of the areas where you were like, no, 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 we could use one brick for this, but we need more to make sure that we have the detail properly captured. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take it off the stand here. Absolutely. So this is the, the display stand that it comes with. Easy to remove off that. Uh. Um, I think uh, probably the biggest part that we really wanted to stay away from just single bricks would be at the uh, cone there. So this piece we could have done several different things and um, you know we really decided we wanted to try to get the uh, sloping and uh, the look correct since mm -hmm. it does have that very interesting little kind of divot yeah. um, in the real one for going into the capsule. Yeah, the uh, the actual spacecraft. Uh, there's a 10 degree difference in slope between the white adapter section and the black capsule, and we, you know, there there just wasn't an existing Lego cone combination that we felt really captured that difference perfectly. They were all just slightly enough off scale that uh, we thought we could do something a little different. And honestly, we spent about probably as much time, if not more, on just the capsule here at the top than the entire rest of the kit together. Sure. Mm -hmm. we well, went through so many different iterations. And I know you guys wanted to make sure that even in the smaller scale that it could break apart like the actual vehicle did itself. Did that kind of work into the way you guys designed it as well? Very much so. Yeah. Um, the staging, we kind of talked about things that we wanted out of this model and I mean it's a large cylinder um, right so it's it's one of those things where there's a ton of different ways that you could you know get the same look um, but in order to also get the staging and make sure that it's swishable and oh, I love you that know, capsule. all the things that uh, you know, brick mania kits are known for we wanted to try to make sure we checked off mm -hmm. um, so yeah the staging was obviously a very large part of one of, one of our goals that we just knew we had to hit. Yeah, well, and it definitely seems like you guys were able to capture detail not only in brick form, but also, like I was saying, through printing, really able to take full advantage of the expanded printing department when it came to adding details to this small of a kit. Yeah, uh, the UV team just knocked the printing out of the park. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to stay away from stickers for the black um, sections. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's crisp, it looks great. Yeah, it really does. And I think that really what, what accentuates that, that printing detail, too, is those trophy scale figures. Um, mm -hmm. Just something, you know, kind of a, a little add-on there to bring that level of detail to that small of a print. Uh, first of all, very Brick Mania, <laughs> mm -hmm. but then also a, a really cool addition to come with a kit of this scale to really take advantage of that. Because, uh, like we said, you know, it is functional, but it is, it is primarily a display piece, and that really, really adds to the display quality. Yeah, no, uh, Slam knocked it out of the park. They look great, um, super, super happy. Yeah, I think the, the kit composition in, in general just mm -hmm. really, really came together nice. A mix of functionality and printed detail. Um, camera guy, I know you are a aficionado when it comes to this, this history. Uh, you want to go into a little bit of a deep dive here on exactly what people who may not be completely familiar with this era of the space race are looking at. Yeah, for sure. So the Titan II started life as an ICBM during the Cold War. And, you know, a, a lot of the early NASA rockets that launched uh, both satellites and humans started life that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the Mercury program, it had its suborbital flights using the Redstone missile and then uh, eventually with the Atlas missile getting into orbit. But when the target was set that they were going to land on the moon before the end of the decade, they knew they needed to start launching a larger capsule into orbit. They needed something with more than one person, they needed something that could sustain people for multiple days, and that meant they needed a heavier, more powerful launch vehicle. Sure. So they looked to the Titan II missile, which was already in development, and they said, okay, how can we make this thing be human rated? Mm -hmm. So they, they went through a whole lot of different variations and uh, tweaks and everything to upgrade it to be human rated, because at the time, the Titan II missile only had about an 80% success rate, 20% of them would explode on launch and they didn't oh, really boy. want to be putting people on that. So they, 
They added a whole bunch of redundant systems, new mm -hmm. avionics. Uh, they simplified a lot of things. And that's uh, how the Titan II GLV or Gemini launch vehicle was born. So the, uh, the rocket itself at the bottom here, uh, one interesting sort of common misconception about this rocket is that it looks like it has two engines. It doesn't. This okay. is a single LR87 engine. It has a single set of turbines that power the fuel through two different combustion chambers. So and that's, then, that's what you're seeing is the two combustion chambers connected to a singular engine. Exactly. Okay. So, and then each of these combustion chambers can gimbal independently and that's how the rocket gets full pitch, yaw, roll, everything like that. Very cool. So one thing about this, uh, this LR87 main engine here on the Titan II, this was responsible for one of the Titan II's most iconic characteristics. And that was the, the Titan Whoop. If you're a space fan, you're probably uh, familiar with that. But basically when the Titan II was launching, it made this, uh, this really iconic sort of sound right when the main engine started. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is these engines used hypergolic fuel, which is two different parts that will immediately combust on contact. Mm -hmm. And the, the turbine in here is what's driving those fuels and mixing them together. But that turbine has to get started by something. So there was actually a starter cartridge that was, it was sort of a little hypergolic explosive cartridge that would burst right at launch and create this huge plume of hot gas that would be forced through the turbine and spool it up. And so as those turbine blades are being forced to go from zero to like a hundred really, really quickly, they make this <laughs> as they're spooling up. And it's it's really loud and really iconic. And even, in, you know, I'll play a sound clip of it here. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. But, uh, you know, even in launch broadcast footage, you can hear this. And if you've seen the movie First Man, uh, it talks about the, the life of Neil Armstrong. Mm -hmm. When he's launching on board Gemini 8, they, you can actually hear the whoop in the launch in that movie. Just great attention to detail there. But that's just a, a cool, interesting little piece of, uh, of this rocket engine. The second stage here has a single LR91 engine. Uh, it actually has a bigger nozzle, not because it's a bigger, more powerful engine, but because the second stage operates in the vacuum of space and you need the exhaust gases coming out of your engine to be as close to the pressure of the atmosphere around you as possible. Interesting. Bigger exhaust nozzle here allows those gases longer time to expand and therefore you're able to get more thrust out of them. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, um, when doing research, we found that the cone was not uh, the kind of copper color uh, we anticipated for the uh, exhaust there, for the engine. Okay, so is that kind of where that red color comes in then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the actual color we found from uh, from photos. Uh, an interesting note about the, uh, so this region here between the two stages is called the inner stage. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty funky looking on this rocket. It's a lot cleaner on a lot of other NASA launch vehicles. Mm -hmm. So what's actually going on here, this rocket, uh, in an effort to make it as simple as possible, used a technique called hot staging. So... When a rocket is floating in zero gravity, the fuel in the tanks is going to be floating around and there's going to be air bubbles in there if you try and just start the engine with the fuel aimlessly floating around the tank. So you need, yeah. you need the vehicle to be under thrust so that it's pushing the fuel down into the bottom of the tank as much as possible. There's been a lot of different ways that people have come up to do that on, say, for example, the Saturn V. There's tiny little solid rocket boosters that kick it forward to shut the fuel back right before the engines turn on for the second stage. But on this one, they use what's called hot staging. And this was, I believe, the only American rocket that ever did hot staging. It's on almost all of the Soviet and modern Russian rockets even, they still do it. But what happens is they light the second stage before the first stage shuts down. So the thrust from the first stage is still keeping the second stage fuel pressed against the bottom of the tank. So these gaps here around the inner stage, those are actually exhaust gaps so that the thrust from the second stage engine can exit out those ports without just completely oh, blowing wow. up the first stage. Yeah, of course, that makes total sense as to why that would be there, but that is definitely an interesting integration. It was definitely something we wanted to put in the model. Too. Yeah, right. Well, and be, like I was saying, being able to put that detail and, and not miss it even in this smaller scale, it, it really adds to just kind of the, you know, it's almost like a mechanical pen. It's just fun to continuously take apart <laughs> and put back together again. A common question people have about rockets is why are there black and white stripes mm -hmm. around these areas? And this actually uh, heralds back to the days of the V2 and Werner von Braun. The oh, V2s boy. were painted with a black and white checker pattern. And the reason is when they were launching them 
and they were you know, observing them and also filming them with their cameras, they needed a way to be able to tell whether the rocket was rolling or mm -hmm. whether it was actually staying in control. Mm -hmm. So these black and white stripes break up the what would otherwise be a constant white or silver silhouette of the rocket so you can actually see that the rocket is rolling just by watching those stripes. <laughs> That's really, really cool. And definitely a cool bit of detail in history to be captured even in, a, a, you know, not necessarily a modern rocket, but one that was certainly a little bit more modern than the V2. So that usually covers a little bit of the history, some of the functions. Is there anything else you guys want to go over uh, on this model? One thing to note about this rocket, this is obviously not minifig scale. The little trophy figures here, these are accurate to scale with the uh, the rocket and its capsule here. Mm -hmm. So this is a fairly big rocket. You know, it was called the Titan for a reason, but as rockets continue to grow, the, the Titan moniker maybe became a little bit less and less appropriate. So this is built to the same scale as Lego's Saturn V rocket kit, which I have here. And you can see when they are laid side by side here, the Titan II is only about the size of one of the F1 engines on that Saturn V. So though this was a big rocket for the time, uh, they certainly got a lot bigger after that. The same scale? That's insane. <laughs> and going forward, so this rocket, you know, this was a staple of the late 50s and early 60s, and they actually continued to launch this rocket all the way up into the early 2000s, if you can believe that. Wow. Uh, this evolved into the Titan III and the Titan IV, and basically what they did, they took this exact same rocket core, and they strapped two giant solid rocket boosters, kind of like you'd see on the space shuttle onto the side to mm -hmm. improve its heavy lift capability. They kind of lengthened the uh, the core in the upper stage. They put a bigger fairing on it, but uh, that actually launched a lot of NASA's uh, early deep space probes. So this was this is kind of a workhorse of NASA. And you can see, if you look up uh, pictures of the Titan IV or launch videos and stuff mm -hmm. like that, it's still got this exact same color scheme. It still has the gaps in the inner stage there for the hot staging. It's it really, this thing barely changed at all in the 50 plus years that it was in service. Which that's incredible considering how fast space technology advanced and how fast it has to advance in order to keep up with just, you know, current tech. That's uh, that's pretty incredible that something like this has even been in service for that long. Well, there you have it then. The, the first camera guy and Amanda combination kit for space race. The Titan II Gemini launch vehicle. This has been the Designer Studio episode. Thank you very much for watching.